Talking with, I am your host, Yale Cohn. This evening's guest is a gentleman who's written two of the most favorite books of mine in the last year, and I read a lot of books. His first book is when we had him on the first time, it was a great novel called Willie Wilden, and he's just released this book called Seldom Right But Never in Doubt. It's a collection of essays which have been written over the, over the course of the last uh, 14, 15 years between 1997 and 2012. They touch on a wide array of subjects food, culture, religion, politics, sexuality, relationships clothing, you name it, there's not one thing left, un one stone left unturned in this book. It was a great pleasure to read, and I guarantee you, since righteous indignation is all the rage these days, there is something in this book that's very likely to offend you. Were I to have been asked, but I wasn't, to write a little blurb on the back, I would have said, Joseph Dobrian is Iowa's answer to Christopher Hitchens. Joseph, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back onto the show. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Let me ask you, these were a series of essays that I mentioned written over the last decade and a half. What was your impetus to put them all together in one spot, one fell swoop, right now, here today? To show off, of course. <laughs> Why else does a person write? And uh, when, when you were putting this together, as we were talking a little bit before the show, it's my understanding a lot of these were uh, previously published elsewhere. There wasn't a list. What are some of the people who might or might not be familiar with you? Where, will they, where would they have seen some of these things published before, some of these essays? Okay, most of those essays were published in fairly obscure publications. For example, the Seminole Tribune, which I believe is the largest circulation American Indian newspaper in the United States. Uh, you would be more likely to see my byline over a business-related article, and you would find that quite often in the Wall Street Journal. Sometimes you would see travel pieces in Golf Magazine, in Travel and Leisure. There's hardly a subject I haven't written about during my career as a freelance writer, which goes back now nearly 30 years. And um, it's one of the joys of being a freelancer is you learn so much about so many different subjects, and that's why there are so many subjects covered in that book. Well, what I really liked on it, you know, I mean, clearly the title itself is almost self-effacing and some seldom right, but never in doubt. I, you know, personally, perhaps with a few, you know, uh, taste issues. I thought you were mostly right. Certainly other people are uh, free to disagree. But when you have the background which you do as a, as a trade writer and stuff like that, when how do you approach writing like, hey, I'm going to give my perspective on something, or I'm going to give my opinion on something, or I'm going to offer advice, solicited or otherwise? Or how do you approach those things differently than someone says, hey, Joseph, we need 5,000 words on this new resort. Write it for us. Okay, because in that case, if I'm writing a business article, my job is simply to report, not to editorialize, unless I'm specifically told to editorialize. So there, it's just the facts, ma'am. But in something like one of these essays, I have free reign to say whatever I like to say as long as I don't actually libel anybody and in order to satisfy myself as long as I am intellectually honest all the way through. A lot of writers aren't. A lot of writers don't feel that that is important. I remember when I was in college, one of my writing instructors said, don't worry about being fair. That's not what we are after here, that's not a way to be a good writer. I disagree. I think you have got to be fair in the sense of honest, whatever you write. Well, I mean, as I mentioned, not just in the title, there's a, there's a fair amount of self-effacing. You take yourself very seriously, but not so seriously, not beyond reproach. But it's interesting that you mentioned about the difference between reportage and editorializing. I've seen a number of times uh, both in local newspapers, in the editorial page, on the op-ed, there would be then comments afterwards, well, this wasn't a very fair article, and how come you didn't cover that side of the perspective? Does it seem just to me, or have you also noticed that people are, there's a blending of editorializing as news or as reportage where people can no longer see the difference? That often happens. It does. Uh, another thing is that while you are obligated, I think, to be fair as a writer and to be honest, you are not under any obligation to present both sides of the issue. If you feel very strongly that the Bears are the better team than the Packers, 
you are under no obligation to present the case for the Packers. Leave that to the Packers fans. Well, I've, I've had a not dissimilar experience even here with the, sh you know, we've been doing the show for quite some time where people have written in or emails or comments like, well, that wasn't a very fair show. You didn't offer this perspective. And even if they're right, not only am I under no obligation to it, I say, well, that's the great thing about PATV is if you want to do a show about issue Y instead of come on down, you know, we'll, we'll help you make a, a, a TV show about that. But you wrote in here and I, I highlighted in my very sophisticated way um, so some of my favorite essays. One of the earlier ones in the book was about apologizing. And you had mentioned that something that you had done very shamefully was, I believe, when you apologize to someone, if I have offended you, I apologize, which right. is all sorts of, you know, preamble kind of absolving. Where do you see as a culture, not just with people issuing apologies of that sort, but with the hypersensitivity that so many people seem to have of demanding apologies at all times. Um, is, do you think one's born out of the other? I mean, are people offering these, these, these non-apology apologies because they don't really feel like they should apologize? Or is that something that, that preceded our, our present era of you know, everyone being so pins and needles, easy to offend? Well, now that's an interesting point, and I hadn't really considered that. I think that one reason that we don't like to apologize is because it would damage our self-esteem to admit that we were wrong. On the other hand, if we really and truly don't believe we were wrong, and if we don't believe that the other person deserves an apology, then we fear the consequences of saying, you know, up yours, mate, you don't deserve an apology. So we come up with this non-apology, such as, if I offended you, in which case you're basically saying, I'm sorry that you were offended, not I'm sorry that I offended you. Crucial difference there. Well, what do you think has led, I mean, and this, you, you touch on this a, a great deal with a number of the essays in here, uh, and as clearly in your great novel, Willie Wilden, about, you know, political correctness and, you know, prohibited thoughts, prohibited words. What do you think has led to our current state where I'm more than quite certain there could be somebody watching at home right now who says, a oh, wool suit, I can't believe I'm offended that he did that to the poor lamb or whatever it was, however innocuous was the thing. How do we get to that point as a culture, as a society, and is that uniquely American? I don't know if it's uniquely American because I don't have sufficient experience with other cultures to say, but I think part of it has to do with our fear of litigation. We have become such a litigious society. People are suing everybody for anything these days. And if you outright admit wrongdoing, if you say, I'm sorry that I hurt you, then you're leaving yourself op open to a lawsuit. If you just say, I'm sorry that you were hurt, then you're not admitting anything. But do you think that that litigiousness is born out of a real sense of, I was wronged and need to be made whole again? Or as you mentioned in, in one of the essays in here, the name escapes me, is that it's used simply as kind of a, a, a bludgeon to keep people from expressing themselves because even if found to have committed no wrong, the insane expense of defending oneself from these kind of charges is enough often to cause people to bite their tongue or not engage in one another, and how that's making a, a unfair and unjust playing field, so mm -hmm. to speak. Right, and it's not happening only in terms of speech or other types of expression. It has to do with, A, there's a sense of entitlement, I think, in our society. We feel quite often that we have a right not to be offended. Which is absurd. Right. You do get jostled as you go through life. I jostle you, you jostle me, that's just part of living. And nowadays people feel that they have a right to never be jostled and they can, they feel that they can collect damages if they are jostled. Another thing is that a lot of people, I, I won't say this is terribly widespread, but it does happen. People will use the threat of legal action in order to get something out of somebody else. Even if they are not in the right, the, the threat of a lawsuit will make the other person make some sort of settlement with them in order to make the suit go away. So if I, if I uh, pay you $5,000 for something that I didn't do, well, that's a lot easier than having you take me to court and I have to pay $50,000. Just to defend oneself. Right. When, when, when things like that happen, and I, it was the essay you had written talking about uh, the lawsuit over uh, 
the Westboro church at Baptist Westboro church. Baptist, and how as deplorable as their conduct may be, to you know prohibit that on a legal basis, as you mentioned, just opens up so many other cans, and that you didn't feel that that guy was really harmed by their behavior, but he wanted to use the law or the courts to bankrupt that right. that that group, which I, I clearly think. Patently evil group, but right. they have a right to be patently evil. Exactly. I mean, in a free society. Exactly. This guy had his feelings hurt. He had his mellow harsh, so to speak. He wanted to enjoy his grief at the ceremony, and it was sullied by these really awful people picketing uh, near the funeral site. Well, that's tough, but that's part of the price we pay for living in an allegedly free society. You have to put up with stuff like that. You don't have the right not to be hurt. Outside of, of those things, and I'm certain that we'll talk more about those, you know, the inane idea that you have right now. One of my favorite essays in here, it was called The New Victorians, and how in in perhaps more innocuous, how we eat, whom to whom we sleep with, that kind of stuff. There's not just people who have elected to take a perhaps healthier path on their own, but seem to go out of their way and, and, and glean great satisfaction from making sure that anyone who doesn't live that way is, is perennially, you know, admonished and chastised. Oh, we have what become is, a nation of finger waggers. It's what is going on? Where, 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 what's informing that? And, and, and how do these people feel that that's helpful, necessary, or just? I don't think that they believe it's helpful or necessary or just. I think that it comes out of a desire to bully and harass other people. Let's face it, we are not nice. Human beings are not, as a rule, nice. A lot of us like to make life tough for other people. We like to bully, we like to harass, we like to get in somebody's face just for the pleasure of doing it. And there are certain types of bullying and harassment that have become fallen out of fashion, let's say, and have become completely socially unacceptable, but they have been replaced by other types of bullying and harassment, such as if I wag my finger at you for eating something that I don't think you should be eating. Or wearing fur, smoking, wearing fur, where you smoking. perhaps used to be more institutionalized things, racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, that kind of stuff, whereas now it's a, how can you eat that or how come, you know, that's, that's, you know, we're just coming here on the heels of election season. And I've seen clearly, I'm more than certain you and I disagree on near as many things as we might agree, but we could sit and discuss it earnestly. And But I, 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 I don't suspect it would devolve into personal ad hominem attacks, where I've seen, however, with uh, other things, whether it's political, social, religious, people now believe in this. I kind of think it stems back to that, you know, uh, we have a right not to be offended, that if you don't agree with me, or agree on issue X, not only by you de facto hate issue X, you hate me, you're the worst person that's ever walked the face of the earth, how do you sleep at night, how dare you, where did we come where people cannot agree to disagree or uh, be rational with one another and well, we've just slipped into this point now where if you don't share my opinion then you're Hitler reincarnate. Okay, well there are a number of reasons. I would point for one to the social media such as Facebook where you don't engage a person directly, you do it electronically, so that you're not in any danger of getting a fist in your face if you insult somebody, so you go ahead and do it. It's also asynchronous, you know, I may write something to you on, on Facebook and you reply three hours later versus here we're in the same room talking I think at the same time, I think that might right. lead into it. Or if you make a joking remark, I might not take it as a joke if I don't see you smiling when you say it, and I might get very offended at that. Another thing is that we have a lot of TV talk shows where people are encouraged to be rude. Places like, shows like Jerry Springer where the participants are actually encouraged to act as trashy as they know how to act. Or shows like Judge Judy where you have a woman in judicial robes deliberately disrespecting the people she interacts with. And a lot of people hold Judge Judy up as a praiseworthy person. I think no, I think she's trashy. Well, not only I, I don't think people are exclusively uh, encouraged to be rude, but also it seems like encouraged to be mad. Are we a matter? I mean, you're a tad older than I am. Are we a, yeah, a matter society good. now? I, mean, I don't think we're a matter society. I think that anger makes good theater. And TV is a business like anything else. They want to sell ads. If they want to sell ads, they've got to get viewers. And the way they get viewers is with good theater. People like to see other people behaving badly. 
And, you know, I mean, you mentioned clearly we're going to jostle one another in life. And with the Victorians, they gleam satisfaction, the new Victorians, rather, gleam some satisfaction out of bullying and haranguing other folks. What, however, do you think, I've noticed that there's a lot of people, not just that are angry all the time, but are perennially offended or seek out ways, like oh, they yeah. almost wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to look through the paper today, what story can I get Fire me up because I'm so shocked and offended That's by right. this. That's right. There are professional offense takers. When did that? When did that uh, become a common thing? I really don't know. It was less common, I think, in my youth, but it has always been around. It's not a new thing. Are we I just more aware of it now? More, more aware exposed of it now. to I it? Think I mean, so yeah, because there's just so much more to choose from by way of media. There are more TV programs. There's Facebook. There's Twitter. There's the World Wide Web, which is the world's biggest public library, let's call it. You know, it's interesting you, you mentioned that about professional offense takers because that was a, a big part of the plot. I'm not going to reveal too much of Willie Wilden, which I highly recommend everyone read. But with folks like that, they're, they're doing so not because, in my opinion anyway, they have a genuine sense of having their feelings hurt, but oftentimes th that's a career that can motiv help them generate funds, exactly. motivate agendas. I mean, Exactly so. And being offended all the time is a way of gaining control over other people. These are people who enjoy being the boss of you. And if they are constantly offended, they are constantly putting you on the defensive. I, I agree with you. I just couldn't imagine ever. It just seems to me like that would be exhausting to be just live your day from dawn to dusk every day, just constantly, it's so woe is me, dark clouds it's over It's idea of a good time. I mean, I would find it exhausting and very unpleasant, as a matter of fact, to go mountain climbing, especially the real daredevils who climb Mount Everest or something like that. But some people enjoy doing that sort of thing. But and at least they're not breaking my leg or picking my pocket by climbing Mount Everest. Which, and they're not annoying me by being offended by anything I say. I'm, I'm really grateful you use that term, uh, breaking a leg or picking a pocket, because that's something uh, folks who've seen our previous show know that you have a, you're a libertarian a political background. You, in fact, ran for the mayoral candidacy when you lived in New York. And that's a phrase I've seen you repeat in person. I've seen you write it. And I, I, I very sincerely believe myself that unless something is causing me injury or stealing from me, people should, whether, and you, you touch on this, whether it's drugs, prostitution, stuff like that, where though did we, uh, how did we arrive at this place though, not just with people, which people can be annoying, but where government itself, I mean, for instance, where you used to live, where I used to live in New York, well, you can't sell sodas of this size anymore. Where did, how did we capitulate control of our own lives or not scream from the mountaintops when government itself and it took on this, this nanny statey role. Okay, there are an awful lot of people who like a big, powerful, service-oriented, controlling government. A lot of people love being regulated. They say, look, I can't regulate myself. I depend on government to regulate me. And there are an awful lot of people who say, well, I know how to take care of myself, but not everybody else knows what's good for them, and we need government to control those people. Government wants to grow. People in government, people who actually have governmental functions, such as congressmen and cabinet members and so on, they want power, they want more power, they want ever more power, and that means that government must grow to support them and to increase the population of people who are beholden to them so that they will keep on getting reelected. That's why we have more and more government employees as time goes by because our elected officials want these people to be beholden to them and vote for them. And I don't think that that's a, a party issue either. I think no, that's a function both parties of do it. where is there an end game in sight with that? I mean, at some point, are we going to reach some critical nadir where we can say we can be regulated no more, we can have no more uh, fifth assistant to the chief inspector of the first section of cheese sandwiches? I mean, where where's the bottom line on it this? It remains to be seen, but I have never seen any government grow to the point where it has to stop growing. It will continue to grow in infinitely. And I don't understand. I can't see how we could ever get a government so big that it couldn't get bigger. And that's what I'm afraid of. But luckily for me, I'm on the back nine of life now, and I probably won't see 
the logical conclusion. But it's bad enough as it is. Do you think that that nature, I mean, are the people that we spoke about earlier who have, have a desire to bully and harangue and, and harass and, and you know, poo-poo your life decisions, what you eat, do you think that, that there's a, a similarity between those and the folks in government who want power? Is today's uh, fur protester, pardon me, today's fur protester, tomorrow's uh, congressman, or are they two kind of subsets of annoyances in life? I think that a lot of the people who go around professionally taking offense uh, do not have the personality type that is required to be an elected official. They are cut out of the same piece of cloth in that they both want to control you. They both want power for its own sake. But the anti-fur protester does that by shouting and getting in your face and making a nuisance of himself. The elected official can't make a nuisance of himself in that way because then people won't vote for him. He, he will be all nice and innocuous so you'll vote for him, and then he'll get it in your face later when it's too late. With more and more people willing to capitulate control of their own life or their own thoughts or their own words, I mean, you have a number of essays in here about, I think one was called the B word and the C word, talking about that, and another one where you talk about you know, how the terms for African American has changed and your, your decision to stick with one over the others and who gets to say what they're called, you know, is there some overarching, but where do you think, I mean, a, a good friend of mine, Nathan Timmel, is a very talented local comic. He's written about and has performed about the wussification of America in this regard. I think he may have used another uh, consonant at the beginning of that word. But uh, how, if, we, if so many people are willing to capitulate control or not speak their mind lest they fend, what would happen in the result of a real crisis to this nation, be it political, you know, uh, uh, you know environmental, if so many people are e either dependent or, or unwilling to act on their own without out, making sure what they want to think or say is okay. What would happen if we really face something? Oh, there are plenty of people. There are always going to be plenty of people who are brave enough to say what they really think. At and what usually, expense, though? It depends on what they're talking about. And they usually are not very influential, but every now and then one of them will make a difference one way or the other. As far as the over-regulation of our society, whether, whether officially through government or just through social pressure, there's really not much you can do about other people. All you can do is live your life as best you can, play your own game, play nice, don't, don't hit your sister, at least not until she hits you first, but pretty much say what is on your mind Behave as decently and as honestly as you can, but don't worry too much about not making waves. You gotta make waves. Well, I, I think so, but so many people are afraid, and, and you touched on this here, and I think also to some degree it was uh, a function of, of the novels that people will be charged with racist, sexist, misogynist, anti Semite. Yeah. Not when they are, but simply because the person so charging is trying to silence or stifle their thought. But that has, it seems to me that that has great traction in our society. Mm -hmm. That's, being called a racist is, a, is worse than being called child molester. Oh, I listen, mean, I've been called racist and homophobic and sexist and God knows what else. I've been called a fascist even though I'm a libertarian, which is pretty nice going because libertarians are the polar opposite of fascists. You just have to when somebody does that, point out to them that they are the one being racist or fascist or whatever, because that is often the case. Not always, but quite often. If somebody calls you racist, that person is unconsciously displaying racism on in themselves by, for example, patronizing black people when they claim to be protecting them. There's a sort of a paternalistic attitude in which they are implicitly stating that this particular group of victims is somehow helpless and needs to be protected by enlightened persons such as them. How, as you said, you know, you, as a person, whether you're a writer, or television, or just a, just a plumber, anything, you can't worry about making waves, though, but how do we, as a society, 
try and engage in more honest dialogue, a more honest discussion about any issue, be it social, political, by taking the power away of people making those blanket, you know, pejorative uh, uh, you know, allegations, say, well, you know what, quit saying it's not true. You've cried wolf too many times. How do we, because there is a great, uh, great amount of power in there, especially as you mentioned with social media that I've found fascinating. I've said on a number of other shows, we're getting alive today, he'd be a blogger. Because I know a lot of people who believe something is carte blanche, gospel truth because they've seen it in their Facebook feed on Twitter 500 times, however patently false it may be. Right. How do we take the power away from those people? I don't know how you do it. I'm still trying to figure that out. I can't kill them because I don't want to go to prison. <laughs> that, uh, would, that would violate the break their leg function of break your leg or pick the pocket. Exactly. Sometimes ridicule helps. Ridicule... I, I see also, you know, and you touch on this a bit, as we've spoken about, that now anyone who disagrees, however passionately, dispassionately, well, they're bullying, bullying, and clearly, I mean, actual bullying is, is horrible and shouldn't be tolerated, but anyone who disagrees or, or is dismissive, well, that person's a bully. They they called me out. They said, mean, they, I didn't agree with what they said. And that's, again, I think, endemic of this, like, softening that no one, every thought you have has to have to be a marshmallow in 2012. Right. Sometimes I mean, you just have to shrug it off and go have a martini and a cigarette and if people think you'll love you for it, poop on them. What, uh, when, you were, when you were compiling this stuff, uh, and again, I do highly recommend it, and thank you very much for the advanced copy, did you have, as I mentioned at the, at the onset of the show, there's a number of topics that you say, I want to have this, this much of the book cover these issues, or no. that, or did you just pick your favorite no, uh, children, I so to speak? No, I picked my favorite essays, and then I divided them into various categories. There's a section on clothing, particularly how I dress, there's a section on food and drink. There's a um, section on politics and the law, which has always been a particular interest of mine because when I was a young fella, I thought I was going to be a lawyer and a politician, and then I realized that that was just going to be way too much work, and I didn't have the right personality for it anyway. But I'm still, shall we say, an amateur lawyer, an amateur politician. Well, besides your uh, candidacy, as I mentioned, when you were in New York, uh, have you given any thought to that kind of thing out here, particularly in, uh, I think, what people either lovingly or disparagingly call the People's Republic of Johnson <laughs> County? Uh, have you given any thought to uh, throwing your hat in the ring locally? I don't plan to run for local office here in Iowa City because I don't think it would be worth my while. I think that there are not enough people in this town who would agree with me, who would elect me. Uh, as for running for public office on a statewide level, I did that in the past presidential election because I was running for the office of presidential elector on the libertarian ticket. And so I was able to vote for myself. Well, wrapping it up and not getting into the results of the uh, election we just witnessed, which a lot of people will be happy about, a lot of people clearly very upset about, uh, do you th what do you think third party uh, strength uh, on the national level. A lot of folks say don't waste your time on the presidential ticket, start locally, start small. I think this country's entirely too big and, and too diverse to have just two parties And What do you see, whether it's the Libertarian Party or any other third party, having a, a future here in our republic? I think that the two-party system is getting more and more entrenched, and it's really not a two-party system. It's a one-party system. The differences between the Demoblicans and the Republicrats are so incremental. It's really an oligarchy. The thing is that as people clamor for more democracy, for more direct election of our officials and so forth, third parties get even less consequential. I hear so many people complain that we really ought to elect a president by direct popular vote. And I say, no, that's a very bad idea if you believe that there's room for more than two parties in this country. Because with the electoral college as we have now, third parties will occasionally be able to exert a little bit of influence. If it was a direct national popular vote, third parties would be utterly eliminated. Well, listen, it's a great pleasure to have you on. If you do run for anything local, we'll have you on and talk about that. And uh, folks at home want to find out more about this book, your previous ones, and also uh, you blog and other stuff like that, where can they find you online? 
josephdobrian.com. josephdobrian.com. Joseph, great pleasure to have you on again. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks again for the great book. All right. Thanks, everybody, home for watching, and we will see you next week.